Hi, I'm Patricia Greenberg. Well, I personally love that I'm aging and I do my, des my best on a daily basis to embrace all that comes with it. One of the best things we can do for ourselves and others is to open up the conversation about our relationships as we age. I'm yeah. thrilled to have Lori Gerber, relationships expert and believer in love. Welcome, Lori. Hello. So Lori, tell us about what you do. I am, well, they call me a relationship expert. And I think the reason is because I messed mine up so well. <laughs> then I worked really, really hard to fix what I messed up and learned so much on the way. Uh, and then I've been coaching people on relationships, everything from dating to keeping love alive, to fixing broken marriages, to amicable divorcing uh, for the last 20 or so years. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, um, if do you want to talk a little bit about the handle method that you sure. um, studied? Okay. Yeah. So the handle method is sort of the underlying methodology behind everything that I teach. And it's a very robust curriculum. It uh, was developed at places like MIT and Stanford. And we continue to teach it in institutes of higher learning all around the world, as well as in companies, big and small, and with thousands and thousands of individuals. So it's a very sort of tried and true methodical um, set of exercises, philosophies, ways of thinking that takes a person from the stage of what determining what they want all the way through unblocking what's in the way mentally and and um emotionally and then through to accountability for action so i i mean i can talk about it for days it's yeah. a it, it worked on me right i had done yoga tai chi meditation self-help galore therapy of course uh you know i had done so much work on myself by the time i was 30 and i had checked so many boxes of you know good job, worked from home, two cute little kids, cute husband, apartment in Manhattan. And I was so unhappy, like despite all of the accomplishments. So I finally found for, in my case, it was finally found the handout method and it worked and it worked quickly and it worked indelibly. And I've never backslid now in almost exactly. 20 years. So I am, I'm personally use it. And I'm also a big uh, you know, proponent of it. And I love teaching it to other people. Well, that's always the best thing. If you fully believe in it yourself, it's going to work for um, yes. for others. Um, <laughs> yep. I love your slogan, love is a verb. And that implies mm -hmm. we need to take action in our relationship. Big surprise, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, people really are brainwashed to believe by our culture and society that love is a noun, that it's a thing you get and then you put it on the mantle. And if you did a good enough job being thin or pretty, like it should stay there perfectly for the rest of time. And it's like, it's, it could not be more absurd to think of it that way. And yet we really are brainwashed to think of it that way. So I try to shift the context to love is a verb. You need to practice it. If you practice it, you will have that feeling. If you don't practice it, you will not have that feeling. And good news, that's all up to you. You know, this, you know, opens up the discussion for, um, we have to work at our relationships. And I don't mean that in any way other than that there's a, a and you know, we, we, we really like to, um, we focus on aging here among other things, but you know, as we get older, we really realize that in, in our 20s and our 30s, like you say, we're just, we're checking off all the boxes and a lot of them aren't working. So do you feel or do you, in your, in your experience, do you see that love does grow over time or it needs to be there in the first place? Can you make something out of nothing? Well, you know, all these love songs we've heard, all heard growing up. Well, I'm going to tell you a phenomenon I do notice that has to do with aging, which is that when couples first get together, often in their 20s or 30s, there is this awesome newness, excitement, chemical stuff that's going on that really helps propel the love forward. And then a lot of people get very busy in their careers and raising children, which is a lot of also newness and excitement and, and um, distraction and intensity that keeps people engaged. What happens when the kids turn between, I'm going to say like when the kids turn eight to 12, so the kids start to get more independent and don't need the parents as much. And then certainly when they leave for college, whoa, <laughs> like the relationship has to be renewed. It has to be renewed. There's no way it got better and better during that 
period when the kids were zero to eight. No, I mean, maybe very rare instances, but most likely that relationship, you either got backburnered or it went freaking right. downhill or you already got divorced, right? So when you find yourself in your forties and then certainly in your fifties, that is actually when you have to consciously renew the relationship, not as a burden, not as a curse, not as poor you, but as, oh, right. <laughs> we have intended to our teeth in 10 years. We better go to the dentist. Right, right. You know, I. it's funny. I think I, I wrote that we were going to talk about that later on. Uh, there's a um, an alarming number of divorces now among people in their 60s, the gray divorcing. Mm, right. And, <laughs> well, they, because people realize they're going to live another 30 freaking years. Uh, yep. <laughs> they're not going to do it unhappy. And, you know, you know the joke. We were waiting till our kids were dead. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, are the kids really going to be okay? Okay, finally, I can be happy. Right. right. And it's um, and it, and it's very sad. Uh, you know, but I think the work has to be done in your forties and fifties. You can't wake up at sixty-five and say, "You can't." Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't. I no doing. longer find it sad because I see what silly reasons people were using back. 40 years ago to get married. To get and married, I, right. How right. much, and I see how much culture has changed and the roles of men and women have changed and what's possible for people has changed. And so I I did find it sad, don't get me wrong, because I love staying married and I love that my parents stayed married and I, you know, I love that, but I now see it quite differently. Like mm -hmm. the deals have changed and because we have changed as a society so much in such a short period of time, there's no way that old contracts could still be good right now. So it so if people are renegotiating and really had a good deal to begin with, that's great. But if not, divorce is often really great for every for everybody involved, frankly. You know, Lori, I feel like we're so much more capable of taking action in our relationships than we think. You know, we they, yes. think there's nothing I can do. But many people are afraid of the confrontation and and they retreat instead of opening themselves up. So contrary to what we think, this is more detrimental and feeds the miscommunication. Can right. you give us a tip on how to address that and work through that? I'm sure there's more than one tip. But... There might be more than one. But, you know, you, we were talking before we came on live about my TEDx talk, which is called The Secret Free Diet, which is all about lying. And it's essentially, and we even call, you know, not communicating lying. Sure. And the the image I want to paint is that if you put something in a closet, it doesn't go away. It it actually festers in the dark. It actually grows like mold when you put it in the dark. So, so that temporary relief that we have sweeping something under the carpet or putting it, you know, in the closet, really doesn't last. It really doesn't. I I wish it, if it worked, I would absolutely recommend it, but it just doesn't work. Um. So, you know, that's what coaching is. That's the kind of coaching that I do. Is it starts with just tell me the truth. Just just tell me what you're not saying. Just tell me what you're not saying. Tell me what you're not saying about what you wish. Tell me what you're not saying about what's not working. And let's see if we can even get you to say it before we even talk about 17 miles down the road telling your partner. I'm curious what you see um, are the top problems. Is it money? Is it not being heard? Is it lifestyle choices? Some people... An example would be took up wellness and lost 100 pounds, um, got into recovery and gave up drugs and alcohol, but the spouse didn't. Right. What, what's the, what do you see as the most common or prevailing theme among couples that can't come back together? That's interesting because I was thinking of the most common things of couples who can come back together. Okay. okay. But I, I think you're on the money with Couples who can't come back together are people who've gone in different directions. I don't want to come back together. That's who can't come back together. Okay. Right. It's, you know, if you, if you're sober and the other person wants to keep partying and you need sober around right. you, that's, that's really, I call that an irreconcilable difference. Or if you want another kid and they don't, or if you want to, you don't want to hit the kids anymore and they really still do. Right? Like it's, right. right. There are really irreconcilable differences. And that's when I get very excited too, or, or even if somebody did something that hurt you that you cannot forgive, mm -hmm. like I, I want you to, I want you to do everything in your power to forgive. I want you to understand why they did it and why you were okay with them doing it and why you were in the position to have that done to you. And I want you to 
be a compassionate person. I want you to be happy in your life so that you don't have to blame that thing. Like I, I do a lot of work with people to get, have them forgive because forgiveness is a much higher vibrational state than non-forgiveness. Right. But I think not being able to forgive something is a good reason to let each other go. Um, but the most prevalent things that I find solvable are crappy communication. In other words, in a, lying, <laughs> you know, like ineffective telling the truth and ineffective listening mm-hmm. uh, and division of labor is a big one. And that, again, because of the times that we're living in is so ripe for re-evaluation. Right. Hello. <laughs> like, and people are not talking about it explicitly. And it is the elephant in the room as far as I'm concerned. And it really breaks people up, right? Because men, number one uh, nag, number one complaint is nagging. And right. and women's number one complaint is he's not showing up. He's not present. He's not he's not communicating. He's not doing chores. He's not like, and the more she nags, the more he withdraws, and the more he right. withdraws, the more she nags. And that is a very, very common. Yeah, that situation. horrible catch-22 that just doesn't resolve itself. You know, we all know when we're lying, like you said, whether it's omission or talking yourself into something that's not there, it's all a form of lying. Um, and we think it's harmless. And one of the, the things is it can't hurt anyone if they don't know about it, yet you talk about that that's festering. Yet it's pervasive and it's cumulative. Yes. Um, I, I, I wanna talk about how the, just a little bit about how the early secrets, subtle, not so subtle, uh, affect our relationships down the road. Right. That um, I didn't tell my husband, I'm not saying this is a real, I didn't tell my husband when I, well, I got, I didn't get married till I was almost 40, but I didn't tell my husband something in my twenties and thirties that reared its ugly head again in your fifties right. and sixties. And your husband wants to leave you because you've been keeping a secret for 30 years. Exactly. I and mean, the best example is, you know, one faked orgasm. If the yeah. next morning you go like, oh, whoops, sorry, I choked. I faked it. I actually didn't have an orgasm could we try this next time is so much more survivable than like, who's ever going to tell I've been faking for 20 years, right? Right. Like, who's been t- right. Who's- right. The amount that they should be mad at you is real, right? Like there is a real consequence to lying for that long. I would think in many, many cases. So, so that's how it builds. And then people take shit to the grave. Like right. I'm never going to tell. And the problem is you cannot have intimacy with someone who doesn't, know who you actually are because they're not loving you but Lori, let's talk about the shame involved girls who had sex before they were married in my generation was more taboo obviously more taboo than it is now um and just a few years later i always use this analogy i graduated graduated high school in 1978 so you could not you still was okay to go to college. It was okay to not go to college. It was okay to get married right out of high school. Nobody stuck their nose up at it. But six years later, when my sister graduated college in the eighties, it, it was unheard of that you wouldn't go to college and you wouldn't, I mean, this is Isn't just that a, amazing. The amount right, it's a six year difference. Yeah. Um, but now when I'm with my, you know, we're all in our sixties. Now when I'm with my girlfriends, we talk about who had a baby out of wedlock, who was having sex with one of the teachers who was right. so, does this warrant a divorce 40 years later? You were so filled with shame. And at the time you weren't gonna tell, you weren't gonna tell your friends, you weren't gonna tell your parents. You could, God forbid, have gotten raped. Are you talking or... about your personal experience? No, I'm just saying that I um, I tell everybody everything. I, I'll tell you how old I am. I'll tell you how much I weigh. I tell you who I slept with. I, I, I'm i I'm ridiculous. But you're saying, don't we understand why people lie? But I mm-hmm. understand when friends come to me now and say, you know, I never told my right. husband, but 30 years ago, da, da, da happened. I understand why they're not telling him. For, so it's their own shame. It's not- why people lie, 100% understand it, think mm-hmm. it's forgivable. Also, everyone's doing it. So there's no, right. there's no shame in lying. Right. And there's no shame in the things people are lying about. And I've interviewed thousands of people about what they're lying about and what haunts them. And it's all the freaking same. Everyone's hiding the same things from everybody else. I've also coached thousands of people in telling, whether it's a day later, a year later, or 20 years later. And almost always it it goes well. Almost always. If you prepare properly, it does not end in a divorce. If it ends in a divorce, one would think there is another reason why it ended in right. divorce. 
not that you told this vulnerable truth you were too scared or ashamed to tell. Unless it was, I've been with prostitutes for the last 20 years or, right. you know, I'm cheating with your best friend. Then, right. you know, we understand why that could end in divorce. Right. Um, so yes, yes, we are shamed as a human culture for everything natural and normal, like especially <laughs> sexuality, <laughs> right. right? So right. yes, it is understandable why people lie in order to manipulate their the perception of themselves. And it is a true heroic, brave, evolutionary act to tell someone the truth. And there's a way to do it. You know, there's a way to make it safer for yourself. There's a way to make it more likely to go well. Right. So that, you know, that's a lot of what we teach. That's a lot of what the curriculum is. I'm assuming that you also teach people how to deal with the reaction of the person that you're telling the truth to. Yes, for sure. So if I were just going to give cliff notes there is a, if you listen to someone, like you're going to hear something new, which is very hard to do because our unconscious bias is so strong, you know, which is why we believe we can't tell the truth, right? Like we just believe these things we make up and we re reaffirm them to ourselves and collect evidence for it. But if we, um, if we, if we listen to someone, like we're going to hear something new, if we listen as if we're going to have to say back what we heard, and even say back what we heard, which is what I teach couples to do with right. each other. It goes entirely different than a conversation that's ping pong. You right. say your thing, they say your their thing, you say, and you're like sort of in a bit of a battle of words rather than you're catching a ball because you want to see and hear someone's ball, which is what I call love as a verb. It's when you care about the other person's experience as much as you do your own. So you hold on to your own experience of life and what's important to you, but you also can receive theirs and look at it and feel into it and appreciate it. So they feel known while you're still holding on to yourself. So the trick to taking someone's reaction is you 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 don't react, right? You you go, right. they're giving me a ball and my job is to look at the ball and hear the ball and understand the ball before I throw the ball back over the net. That's the trick, I think, to taking in someone's And response. do you say no matter how horrific it may sound at the moment, count to 10 or keep your calm or? Let me just say, when I don't send someone into a hard conversation without a lot of preparation. Right. So most likely they're not going to need to count to 10 because we've run every scenario. We've set the conversation up well. We've set aside time. We've practiced it. We know the purpose of having the conversation. We know what we're going to do if this or that outcome happens. We know how to take notes when someone's responding. We're okay if it goes badly. We're okay if they don't respond. We're like, I don't send someone into battle without armor and weaponry and, you know, a good attitude. So, so counting to 10 may work if you don't do all that preparation, but mm -hmm. I prefer the preparation. And this is like free information on my blog. If you have a little bit of money, you can buy a program and learn all of this and practice it. If you have a lot of money, you can get a coach and really practice it. You know, there's many ways to get a load of the the details that we don't have time to go into today. You want to, you want love to be alive and grow. And what I want is um, I'm getting away from my new mantra is that we all talk about aging gracefully. I want to age peacefully. Aging peacefully is that you feel safe going home to your spouse, that you feel at home in your own home, and that you feel that you're a family and you're not dancing around anything. And um, this is a process and this is work. And I find that it's also a, an ebb and flow, that sometimes you feel like you can say anything and other times you feel uh, dismissed or that you you can't talk at that time. And I, I hope to think that you can come under to, to an understanding that that comes and goes in relationships. Um, I, I want Again, to- I don't know um, about comes and goes, but I do know about asking permission to have the conversation and yeah. not asking someone. Yeah. Like someone will tell you if it's a good time or not okay. if you ask. That's a really good point to not well, walk like into a room and start yeah. spewing, but to actually- admit, Your partner is doing something else when you walk into the room right. and you right. are interrupting. Right. <laughs> so set aside the time and ask, get consent. It's the same- yeah. Any everything other else, form, right? Any right. other form of interaction? <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, um, uh, let's talk about relationships with parents, grandparents, and children. Why have we gone from a society that revered having multi generational households where kids and grandparents were role models for for right. marriages? 
And we don't well, have that. I guess there's no answer. There's a I know I think there's probably that, a but... very good sociological answer oh, yeah. for people who have studied it. But yeah. but what but I did want to speak to your your point about aging gracefully and really mm -hmm. what I think what I actually think helps a person age gracefully, besides obviously having dreams and a mission mm -hmm. beyond career and raising children, which was so preoccupying up yes. until this time. Um is resolving issues with their children and their parents, right? Yeah. So let's say for a 60 year old, right? The potentially aging right. parents are gonna be helping gracefully exit and these adult children who right. you now have to reformulate your relationship with completely differently because yes. they're no longer, hopefully no longer dependent upon you. So to me, a huge part of aging gracefully is to resolve those relationships using the same tools as you would in your love relationship using the same uh, designed conversations where you hear each other and understand each other and design new ways of being. The ways I'm with my parents now, and then they're in their 70s, and I'm in my 40s, so different than any other decade of our interaction and will continue to change mm -hmm. as they age. Same with my kids. I have kids now out of the house. It's like, oh my gosh, totally different. Right? Like they just came home. Like, do they do their chores? Do they not do their chores? Do I have to do their dishes? Like they're 20, they make money. Like, you know, yeah, like I, I know. Mm -hmm. Right. So you, you're renegotiating, renegotiating all of those relationships to have peace in the house. There's so many people who don't have peace in the house because their kids come back and expect for it to go back the way that it was. Right. Or their parents get sick and now they're totally bifurcated dealing with aging parents or both. Right. It's like, things need to be redesigned consciously. Yeah, and you have to step away in both directions that it's your parents, but they have their needs for aging and it's your children and they're forging their own adulthood and you have to, on one hand, stay out of it. And um, I am learning with my daughter because she's 21 to let her come to me. I'm trying to let her come to me rather than saying, you're, don't do this, don't do that. And she says, I'm 21, I'm not right. five and you're taking me on a play date. I'm like, okay, but watch me before you cross the street. Yeah. <laughs> We have a we have a joke in our family about that exact same thing because my my husband's grandmother told her son in I don't know the twenties or thirties yeah. or whatever when he went to college he said uh, don't uh, don't buy firecrackers <laughs> don't buy so we just say don't buy firecrackers <laughs> that's your standard joke that's we our always code joke, yeah ours is don't eat any dead birds because. Um, my daughter, we I'll tell you a funny story is that she she sent me this, uh, I guess it was a TikTok or something that this boy said, oh, do you know what it's like to have a Jewish mother? My mother comes to visit me in New York and we're walking down the street and there's a dead bird and she says, don't touch it, don't go near it. And he says, mom, what do you think I do when you're not here? Do you think I stop and lean over and eat it? <laughs> so my joke with Gabrielle, uh, I drop her off at the airport is don't eat any dead birds. Yeah, That is... Yeah. Every Jewish mother needs yes. a little joke about yes. that. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. So um, I, I just have to tell you, Lori, this is just such a wonderful conversation. Um, we have just a second left. So in closing, I want to ask you, what do you like about getting older? Oh, my God, so many things. I really love getting older. It, it You get to use everything you learned. So you're at your most wise as you get older. I, I don't even know what else to say. It just feels like you just get more and more freedom and more and more understanding of bullshit every day, every week, every year that you get older. It's absolutely. And if you're not afraid of dying, it's like, it's the best. It is. And, um, you know, I, I can't encourage people enough that there's just so much more to live for and so much more out there. Lori Gerber, so happy to have you here. You can reach her at lauriegerber.com for coaching services, information, and just learning about love and what she does. And I, I encourage you to go look and, um, and see what it is she has. And I, and I wish you all the best in all of your relationships. And if you enjoyed this show, take a minute to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Patricia Greenberg, where we talk about all things aging well. You can also reach out to me and for more information about Lori at www.patriciagreenberg.com. Thank you all for joining us. And Lori, thank you. You are so welcome. <laughs>